Okay, we're going to call to order the July 10th Transportation Advisory Board meeting. Uh, roll call. Chair Lehner. Here. Board Member Bennett. You don't have to worry about microphone, sorry. Here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Board Member Wickland. Here. Board Member Christ. Here. Board Member McInerney. Here. Board Member McKee Burrows. Here. Board Member Kim. Here. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. And so um, finally, we have a quorum, I guess we should say, right? So I'd like to do an introduction of our new members. And I guess we'll start, Nicholas, on, on your side. You can start. Um, you have the luxury of being on the end. So uh, we'll start with you. Um, hi. My name's Nick. Uh, Nick Kim. Please don't call me Nicholas. That's what my mom calls me. Um, I'm excited to be on tab. And um, I'm looking forward to working with everyone here. Okay. Um, next, Gina. Hi, everyone. I'm Gina. Um, I have been on the Bicycle Issues Committee for about the last nine months. And I was encouraged to apply to TAB to have a little bit more influence. So that's why I'm here. I'm David McInerney, and I am beginning my third year as a board member. I became interested in the board when I read the Envision Longmont Multimodal and Comprehensive Plan. I decided that the plan proposes a positive direction for Longmont's future, and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get involved in turning the plan into reality. Uh, my background includes about 30 years with private sector consulting firms. My particular areas of expertise were land use and environmental planning, but I worked on dozens of projects that had significant transportation components, and they involved many different uh, modes of transportation. I'm a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, and that's it for me. Vice Chair Christ. Hi, I'm Diane Christ, and I started on the board at the beginning of 2022, and I became vice chair at the beginning of 2023. I have been doing a lot of field studies recently. I was involved in one automobile accident um, since our last meeting and uh, witnessed another automobile accident in our neighborhood just a week ago. So um, it was kind of funny because when I, it, there were no injuries in my accident, but I was talking to the police officers about what they thought might have caused the accident. And they said, you really don't need to know this for your insurance. And I said, you don't understand. We need to know this for the transportation board. <laughs> They thought that was funny. So and then they answered some questions. They, um, and we can talk about that later, and that'll come up. Um, I was down on the diagonal, and I was thinking of you, Nick, because you said it's impossible to cross that. And I was like, he is right. That is a lot of traffic down there. And I don't drive that way very often. So um, anyway, so uh, our goal um, that we've put before city council is Vision Zero. And we're off to a whiz-bang start. In fact, we're studying, like I said, field studies. And, um, and all this information is helpful to moving forward, I think. So we're happy to have all three of you as new board members. As Steve and I did um, the interviewing, we have high hopes for all three of you. Welcome aboard. Great. And board member Wickland, get you here. Well, hello all. Um, uh, I guess, you know, Taylor Wicklin. Um, I don't know what, what's kind of funny here. This is the first full board in my existence, and I've been here for a year, um, which is great. So I'm excited for the next year of a lot of diverse opinion, hopefully. So, um, you know, and I'm here because I'm 
I'm a little too involved, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm also on the bike issues committee with Gina. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, I've been advocating for Vision Zero for a couple years now, so I'm real excited that I get to be part of the, the process um, and the discussion around that. Um, but then, yeah, a lot of my experience is just based upon personal, personal things I've seen um, from around the world. Uh, traveled to Globe for two years. Um, lived in Sweden, lived in New Zealand. Uh, they do things all very, very differently than we do. And um, so I'm, I'm always excited to move the needle any, any bit forward we can. So thank you. Um, Board member Bennett. Hi, my name is Garrison Bennett, and I uh, this is my first meeting here. Um, and uh, I've spent about 15 years in Longmont, uh, Colorado born, and uh, I've seen, um, I was uh, really excited to have a commuter rail here, here in Longmont, and have since uh, done my civic service in trying to elect uh, people to city council that um, really believe in public transportation. Um, but I feel that sitting on the sidelines and watching the headlines and advocating for other people has not been enough. And um, I wanted to step up and be a part of this board. And so I'm excited to be here today to expand regional transportation uh, to make sure that our bikeways um, have a continuous uh, path from A to B and um, that we can explore new exciting options that could make our city exceptional through microtransit and other exciting options. So I'm happy to be here. Well, great. Um, welcome to everyone. And I'll go ahead and I'm, I guess I'm Chairperson Lehner, been a board member. I think uh, David and I came in in the same time, a couple of years now. Um, and I would echo what um, council member or board member McInerney uh, talked about with Envision Longmont. That would be uh, the impetus for me as well to get involved. Um, my background is actually government technology um, as well as transportation. So I'm actually back in the transportation industry. Uh, just this, That just happened recently, which is good, good news for me at least. Um, I'm an avid cyclist. I used to work in the bike industry years and years and years ago. So I have a particular concern about um, bicycle issues, mobility. Uh, micro mobility and those sorts of things. Um, so I guess that's my story as well. And I guess the final, since we had a late arrival, Council Member Yarbrough. Hello. We finally have a full board, so we thought we'd uh, do introductions here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I see that. I was like, where do I sit? Let me look and see where I sit. <laughs> Amazing. This is a beautiful sight, a very beautiful sight. Um, so happy to have you all here on the board. Um, I am Councilwoman uh, Yarbrough, Councilmember Yarbrough, Councilor Yarbrough, uh, however you want to address me. Uh, I like Shakita better. That's what my mama named me. But um, um, I am very honored to have, to be, to sit on this board as the council liaison. And I myself am learning a lot. So if you ask me something and I don't know, I may say, go to Phil or uh, someone else that has way more experience, a staff person. So um, I am learning just like many of you. So um, thank you for being here and thank you for applying. So yes, great. Okay, uh, we will move on to um, our 2023 election of officers for chair and vice chair. Uh, I guess we'll start with chair. Uh, any nominations for chair? Uh, I'll nominate you, Steve, again. Yeah. <laughs> I second. Are there any more nominations? No? Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. 
And I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. I'd like to nominate uh, Vice Chair Chris for the role as Vice Chair again. Do we have a second? Second. That's fine. Do we have any other nominations for Vice? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so it's done. Congratulations, Vice Chair Chris. Okay, item number five will do the designation of places for posting of meetings per state statute. And I'm gonna need help with this, Phil, so you probably have some material on this. Yeah, let me help out a little bit. I apologize we didn't put this in the packet, but my name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. And we just need every year to redesignate our place of where we put the agenda, where we post the agenda. That is typically at the west entrance of the Civic Center, right up here at the store above, the, uh, up at the top of the stairs. So with that, I would open it up to um, a motion and a second and a vote for that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll need a motion to approve the posting of that on the west end of the building. Do I have a, um, Oh, I'm sorry. We also post on the web. I gotta yes. say that. I was, <laughs> I was gonna note that, yeah, but I guess sorry. that's so ambiguous. Yeah, we also po uh, under, um, the agenda packet is under PrimeCov. Okay, agenda management portal. Thank you. Bill, did, are we changing back to the physical posting? I th it's my understanding that that's always been the physical posting place. And we did talk, I think, last time about just web, but that's always been the posting place. And so we're just going to formalize it now back, if, if that's possible. With I see. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll need a motion to approve that. Uh, move to approve the posting. I second the motion. All those in favor of the stat of the posting of the what the meeting notice on the west end uh, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, we've got that out of the way. Number six will approve the minutes of the preceding meeting. Are there any comments or notes for the minutes from the preceding meeting in May? Okay, we'll need a motion to approve those minutes. I move to approve the minutes from our May meeting. I second the motion to approve minutes. Okay, all those in favor of approving the May minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that is passed. We'll move on to number seven, communications from staff. Phil, I'll let you take this over. Thank you very much. Um, again, Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager. We just wanted to let folks know, and we thought we'd get a press release, so we kind of, the press release was out, but nobody picked it up. So I guess it's not very exciting. It's just us transportation geeks that really like, like this stuff. But we did win an award from the federal government for $25 million. I think a lot of you might have seen it if you're, if you're keyed into the transportation information at least. That did go out to all the folks on the e-notification list. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, it's $25 million. It finishes out the 119 Bus Rapid Transit Corridor. And specifically, it does pay for, uh, for the most part, we're gonna see how far the money goes. Um, but it pays for the design and the construction of the intersection reconstruction at 119 or the Diagonal Highway or Ken Pratt Boulevard and Hover. So that intersection will be rebuilt with the boulder bound lanes and an additional bicycle trail going underneath the Hover um, portion of the roadway. And so that'll free up what we think is a lot of, uh, 
a lot of turn movement, you know, the, the conflicting movement that was the Hover, uh, well, the Longmont bound diagonal going north on Hover. That's a huge movement at that inter intersection, especially in the PM peak hours. And so we think that that will really make Kyle's job easier as far as, and our jobs as far as Vision Zero a lot easier with the safety measures that are gonna be improved at that intersection and the separation of bicycle and pedestrians being able to cross that safely. And there are some bus movements that are gonna be added to that as well. So there's, it's truly a multimodal piece. It's something we've been fighting for for four years now. We've gone to Washington DC, we've lobbied, we've lobbied, we've lobbied, and we've lobbied, so that's four lobbies. Um, and finally, this one, we, we, we got it. So very exciting. Uh, the mayor was a big part of that as well. So um, many kudos to her for doing these trips with us to DC and former mayors, I should mention as well. So um, it's been a long time coming. We've got 10 years under our belts of planning this. So this is never quick. And, I, and that's just kind of the reality of what we do here is it's, it's, it's a long planning process. So we're excited about that. And the other piece was we did get a state award for $1 million. It's a, the money turns out to be federal dollars, but it was awarded by the state um, for our section of Kaufman Street between um, Boston on the south end and First Avenue on the north. So it's a missing piece of Kaufman Street that doesn't exist today. That will be a truly multimodal corridor as well. It'll allow for car traffic, bus traffic, separated bikeway and separated walkways. Uh, as well as some parking, some kiss and ride facilities for the bus operations that is gonna be right in that same block. So we're excited about that. And then the third thing was just the recognition of the city of Longmont for being the number 10 uh, medium sized city uh, for bicycling. So in the whole country, I believe it's just the United States that there was a worldwide competition of these things, but within the United States, we were the top 10 medium sized city. So that's exciting as well. I mean, we've actually moved ahead of Fort Collins, which I find amazing. But um, in talking to Ben in, in, um, in the back, he did a lot of work to make sure that we got the information out to the, the folks that do these surveys. So they got the right information because we really felt for a number of years that they weren't taking the whole picture into account for Longmont. So those are the three big things that we have to talk about. So any questions? Uh, first off, congratulations. Thank to you. everybody in the yeah, staff. Awesome. I, I, I know how hard that is. <laughs> Phil, we, we know how hard that is, and that's that's amazing. The the staff, everybody that pulls together to do that, that's that's amazing it work. Is a, it's total team, yeah, exactly. Yes, thanks, Phil, and your team for all that hard work. The $25 million grant, did that have a title or a name? What program was that? Oh gosh, now I'm gonna have to remember what the acronym stands for, but it's, um, it's RAISE Grant, R-A-I-S-E. I'll take my time here. Well, <laughs> I should know what it means, of course, but um, it's, it used to be called the Tiger, uh -huh. then it was the Build, and then it became RAISE. And so each one has a different set of words that go with that acronym. And, uh, but it was, it's been out there for a couple of years. Uh, Basically, it's just based on the administration that takes over. So this is the Biden administration's name for it. It was Tiger under Obama, then Trump uh, build. Rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and equity. That says it all. Um, I saw a reference recently to uh, something happening with Safe Streets for All grants. Anything for Longmont in that? I'll turn that over to Kyle. Uh, yes, we just, um, I submitted a um, request for application. Um, still needs to go through review process before we get updates for it, but ideally what we were asking is a $2 million grant to provide uh, signal uh, detection upgrades along our uh, minor arterials, so like 17th and 9th that uh, are adjacent to schools. Um, so the title of that grant is uh, Lamont's uh, Safer Signals to School. Uh, so hopefully we provide more bicycle and pedestrian detection um, at intersections. So um, hopefully we hear back down that one soon.
I'm surprised that um, there that there was not um, any media that picked up the uh, twenty five million dollar grant, given that there was previous Times Call articles that um, that talked about the possibility of previous failed failed like grant proposals. So um, I was just wondering if there was going to be any further attempts to try to make it more publicly notable noticeable or. That's a great question. I'm not sure if we as the city will do anything more at this time, but we'll keep on. As this project moves forward and it gets into the more final design phase, we will be going out to the public regardless to get feedback on that design. And so that'll be part of the outreach efforts. Um, again, we don't have much lat latitude with that design because it, it's it's not a lot of money compared to trying to uh, you know, build up basically an overpass or a grade separated interchange. So, but CDOT is gonna be the lead agency on that. So we will kind of relinquish control at this point. And that's a good thing <laughs> based on our resources. So we're very glad that they are taking over control of that. And they will go out with the public outreach on the design. And then when they go to construction, obviously that's, it's gonna be in the news quite a bit, right? So they're hoping to go to construction. Uh, they're hoping to get design done in 2024 and go to construction in 2025. So it's a quick project here now that they do have dollars. But you'll hear, there'll be a lot of this in the news <laughs> and the rest of the construction project you just heard about too, so. Um, you just answered my question about time frame, but um, to do with the Kaufman project, is that now fully funded? And if so, when is the time frame for that project? So the current, Jim Angstad, Director of Engineering Services uh, with Public Works. Uh, Coffin Street is currently in its final stages of design. We are starting property acquisition now. Anticipate going out to bid uh, at the end of 2023 with construction starting in 2024. Um, so we have been able to compile a, 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 a number of funding sources, uh, including dollars in, in the 2024 budget, and we're anticipating that even with cost increases, it will be, it is now fully funded, or will be in, with the approval of the 2024 budget. Um, Phil, you mentioned that for the uh, DIAG, the 119, the grant. It, you mentioned something P and K hours. What does that mean? I'm just unfamiliar with the term. Oh, my apologies. Uh, the, we call that the PM peak. So the afternoon rush hour basically coming back into town where everybody's using, a lot of people are working in Boulder, coming back to Longmont or through Longmont and using that, uh, what we call eastbound diagonal to northbound Hover and that left stacks up as you probably know and, and it takes a while to get through. So by eliminating the cross traffic, that movement should be much easier in the future. Uh, yeah, I just kind of want to second everyone else on congrats, but um, also I'm, I'm very excited for Coffin Street. So, you know, being part of the, seeing all the renditions for the last year and a half, two years. So, and maybe that will bump us up to maybe number one. Yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah, congrats. Well, we have a Vision Zero update for you because we know that this is a key topic for this board. So I will turn it over to Jim Angstead. Thank you, Phil. Um, so in the last few months, staff has been working on um, working through some of the, the staffing uh, evaluations we would need, uh, tying it into budget. Uh, we've been working with, with uh, th this is kind of the budget time. So one of the items that is in the budget is Vision Zero. It is uh, located in both the, the capital uh, budget as well as uh, there is some in operating. Um, so, uh, council has asked us, um, we're working on breaking those out into like an outline similar to what I provided you, uh, but it'll have the, the funding for five years as well as, as, uh, kind of some of the, the short term work we're going to be doing. Um, we'll be getting to that to you by the next meeting. Um, what I did provide, uh, to you is basically a, uh, the first step, uh, once we establish a, uh, kind of a stakeholder task force, uh, will be, uh, 
the draft of a, a, a Vision Zero action plan. Um, so we, we provided uh, kind of an outline of what that plan might look like. Um, this is kind of based on kind of staff's perspective. So uh, it, it might or might not look like that. Um, I've offered it up to the board to, to make some comments on it. Um, by the next meeting, uh, you can write on it, send me, send me comments if you want a, a Word version. I can certainly send that over so you can edit it. Um, you know, we listed some of the objectives. Um, there we could come up and the task force could come up with different objectives, um, as well as the action plan items. Uh, a lot of the, the, the other action plans I was, I've been reviewing have kind of breakouts of several components, engineering, uh, the enforcement components, um, education policy, uh, and then I broke those out a little further. Uh, again, um, try to snapshot uh, a lot of things. Uh, there could be differing items. Don't I, mean, I noted it as, as as a draft, so don't assume that is what what the action plan would include. Uh, but I open it up. Uh, I think where we're going to start with is is tab just kind of setting. If we want the 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 committee to be successful, we want to lay, start laying some of the ground rules and have a starting point. Uh, I think this outline would serve as that. So um, we would ask you, uh, you know, when you're uh, in the, within the next before the next meeting to to. You know, provide some comments on it and see if there's anything else you want to add. Uh, take away. We don't have to debate them. Um, we'll let the committee decide that uh, in the future. Um, and then on the uh, the third page, there's a, a plan information. Each of those items, action items in the plan, would be broken out and have the title of the action, uh, who the lead is, uh, whether it's it's transportation planning or engineering or PD. Uh, there would be then a support person as well. Um, an action description, the reason for the action and the objective, and then within the objective would be the time frame and metrics. Um, in some way, we would lay that out in the plan. Um, and then I listed also uh, what we visualized as some of the stakeholders. So I would ask you guys to look, take a look at that and see if there's, in your opinion, there's any other stakeholders that we would want to include uh, for the task force. I think that was everything. So, Jim, as, as I see this, we're to take a look at it as a draft. Yes. Make any notes, any comments that we'd like to add to it uh, so we don't need to do that tonight. Um, and we'll come back at the next meeting and have a discussion around this as a, as a plan moving forward. Is, it, is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah. I just want to make sure we're clear on it. I was visualizing that, that we could do a little yeah. homework and, and bring it back and then and kind of pin down this outline a little bit for a little more definition. Um, certainly things we can add. Um, we tried to uh, cover things with per policy as well. Um, some of these items, as we, we look at them, are going to be critical if we want to invoke some, you know, some Vision Zero kind of changes uh, in the field. Uh, we have been locked into um, the MUTCD and following that standard for a long time. And it, uh, MUTCD is Manual Uniform Traffic Control Devices, uh, which, which is, is tied to state statute. It's the law we follow. So if we, we may have to, to revise city code, um, to take parts of that out so that we can actually then, you know, perform. Uh, that's one of the kind of one of the historically, uh, one of the delays in that, that traffic engineers have always dealt with in, in kind of solving problems in the field. It takes a long time. And with Vision Zero, we kind of want to accelerate that, some of the uh, improvements we want to undertake. Or at least that's the plan. Um, hi, Jim. Hi. Um, how long have you been working on this plan? And um, do you mind me asking, do you know what cities you like looked at for reference and guidance? Um, so we've been working on this for about two months now, since the last meeting. Uh, Vice Chair asked us to put together an outline, so we started working on it. Um, it uh, I, I, I went to the kind of the Vision Zero website and they um, track down a, a federal website for federal highway that lists a number of the cities that have adopted Vision Zero. So I started pulling action plans from there. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, um, Boulder had a, has one. I looked at Fort Collins. Um, there's a number of, of ones that I just pulled and looked through. Um, a lot of them are following the same, kind of not necessarily the same format, but the same information and just written in a different way. 
Uh, and if need be, we can send you, I can track down that link again and send it to the board and, and so you'll have those references. Um, so I was just wondering how the city envisions making Vision Zero happen. Like, is it going to be involving um, changing code, um, changing priorities? Like, how how is it actually going to be facilitated, like the achieving Vision Zero? I think that's going to be embedded in the action plan, but it, it involves the basically change it does involve changing policy. It's listed in the outline. A uh, number of policies have to be rewritten. A number of, of kind of the manuals we follow would need to be rewritten, reformatted, uh, kind of different criteria for them. Um, it'll involve uh, different, kind of a different take on some of our engineering and how we, how we view it. Uh, involves significant amounts of data collection and using that data as to make priority decisions. Uh, we do some of that already with our crash, crash report. Um, it just getting to the point where um, the crash report, we're usually about a year behind. So we're working right now on the 2022 crash report. Um, and the previous five years, we sum it up in, and this is a, about four or five of them in here. It's about 50, 60 pages of, of data uh, on crashes. But, um, and then historically our, our traffic unit has looked at that and, and made adjustments to signals, small scale improvements. Um, it's just we don't do it in a transparent manner. We don't advertise it. It just kind of gets done. Um, but Vision Zero would would draw more of the community and some of the decisions we make as well, which is the, the reason for the task force. Does that give you enough information? Okay. I just want to say thanks, Jim. Um, this is very thoughtful and, and um, a good approach to begin with. And I really appreciate you getting that done for our new board members so we can all start on the same page. Appreciate all you do. You know, one of the things your staff does is uh, really makes a nice bridge between the data collection and the human element. And that's very appreciated. Okay, um, TMP update, Phil? Yeah, I'll just do a quick update on the TMP, but before I go on, I just wanted to recognize a, one of the former city members in the audience, Micah Zagorski, who really was a big piece of the Raise Grant Award for the Over 119 project in that he did a lot of preliminary work for the, for the design, so we appreciate that. And he also did a lot of work on Kaufman, which kind of Disappears now that he doesn't work for us anymore, but uh, I'm thinking he might want to listen to about what's going on with the TMP as well, but um, We are currently releasing that TMP the transportation mobility plan is what it's called It's really um, the overreaching overall plan for the for transportation for the city and uh, We are out right now with the scope of work and all the different pieces to get a proposal going this month it's taking quite a while and and uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, that's the way the resources are. So we're waiting till about the middle of this month to release. Then I plan on it being out for about six weeks to give consultants enough time to kind of find it and also then reply to it. And so we're hoping to get proposals back probably at the end of August, early September. And then at that point, we'll review those, bring people in for um, interviews, which we would probably like to get one at least one transportation advisory board member to help us with that review. So we'll just kind of plant that seed today and then probably ask you again in August at our August meeting if, if we have enough agenda items. We'll come in, and back and we'll ask for you to consider a board member to sit on that, um, on that review panel. That being said, we should have somebody in-house uh, working with us late October, early November. I'm trying to be a little conservative here, but we'll see how that works out and before the holidays for sure, and then get going in earnest in uh, 2024. Any questions on that? Just to clarify, this is the, the master plan that you guys have been working on that uh, of, of all the projects coming up, is that correct? 
This is, um, excuse me, this is a little different, uh, okay. board member Chris. This is the, this is kind of the overall long-term plan. And so we'll be coming back to you in August. Actually, we will be having a meeting in August. I know that um, because we are coming back with the 2024 uh, capital improvement pro project program or program projects. And uh, we'll also talk a little bit about what's going on in 2023 to bring you up to speed on what's been going on this summer during construction season as well. So there'll be kind of a two-parter there from some of our engineers uh, and project managers on those projects. So that will be happening in August as well. But what we're talking about is an update to the mass or the mobility plan, which we used to call the multimodal transportation improvement pro plan. And so that was part of Envision Longmont. It was a sub, it was like an appendix to that. And it really did try to lay out each project as far as all the different uh, types of modes and how they fit together. And we're trying to go back out to the public, figure out if the public still agrees with the methodology that was used in Envision Longmont for that transportation mobility plan and bring it up to date and refresh it. It's been a number of years now, so we're just kind of want to get that together as far as uh, project priorities. Uh, the council has changed. The Tra Transportation Advisory Board is brand new. So are these the priorities that we originally went out to the public with uh, seven years ago? So uh, we, we're just trying to refresh it. So that's the grand plan. And then the CIP, the capital projects are the, sort of the realization of elements of it. Is correct. that correct? Okay. Right. And then the... CIP we try to do in a five-year increment, typically. So we try to put that together in, in the next five years. What's going to where will the money be directed? And this mobility plan, transportation mobility plan, is meant to direct how those dollars flow in the future and kind of give the 25-year outlook at least, and mm -hmm. and kind of give us a direction to move toward. And then those projects come together um, as part of that 25-year planning cycle. So we're ready for transportation in the future, yes. which is a great idea. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do we have any public in, uh, here to speak? Okay. Um, I guess then we can move on to the information items on the uh, microtransit update. I'll shift to this microphone now, and we'll got a short PowerPoint for you, very short. Um, I know it's been kind of a crazy evening for everyone as well, for brand new members and all this good stuff. But well, we do do presentations at these transportation advisory boards quite often, so I just wanted to get you used to listening to us a little bit about these different items. But this was microtransit for Longmont. We just wanted to kind of describe what's going on with this. The council's already heard this. And typically, we like to get this in front of the Transportation Advisory Board first, get your recommendation to council, and then we usually take that to council. This one was fast-tracked. I try to use that very carefully without saying fast-tracks. Um, but this has been this was fast-tracked, and it had to get to council because we were applying for a grant, and that's in the packet where we were applying for a partnership program, and that that information was due last Friday. So in order to make that and get council buy-in to that process, we needed to take it last month. And so this is a presentation from June 20th uh, to city council, but it does have some, some nuances in it. So really quickly, what is microtransit? We were talking about doing a system of four, van, four to six vans. They'd hold six passengers typically. It's the idea of getting a really Uber or Lyft-like service, but with the larger vans and with professional drivers who are qualified, have a certain le level of qualification beyond what a typical Uber or Lyft driver probably does. Um, but you'd still use the app, an app to call, to, to uh, request service, or you would call in, and that call in would have, would have an equity piece to it that it would have any language, basically. They can cover almost any language that's spoken uh, th through the way that the call is, is, um, is moved through the system. They can move it to, basically, you just, start speaking in your language and they can actually use an app, to, they use an app on their end to figure out what language you're speaking and send it to the right person for translation. Um, 
the, the real vision for this microtransit is that within 30 minutes, you would be able to request a ride, be picked up within uh, you know, a couple blocks of your house or your, wherever you're trying to request this ride from, and then within that 30 minutes, you'd reach your destination. So this is really a robust uh, call and ride service, much more than what we have out there today with, with RTD. I'll talk a little bit about that later too. So we think that the microtransit is, is really good for Longmont in that it has the ability to adapt to basically what's, what's happening on the streets right now. And if we have any special events or anything like that, or if we have some closures due to construction or other things like that, we can move vehicles around and really get um, um, folks where they, need, where they need the service, we can get the service to them because we can ramp up the service or dial down the service based on conditions out there right now. Uh, this is very similar to our bus shelter program. What we do is we contract with a private vendor and basically we give them the okay to build the shelters. They go out, build them, maintain them, take care of them, do the advertising on them. So that's a, that's a little bit of a nuance. There might be some advertising with these as well. But um, we basically turn it all over to them. We're the administrators, so we say where we like shelters or where we don't like shelters. Uh, and we have some say in that. This would be the same way, but with this uh, co private contractor being a shuttle or a microtransit provider, we wouldn't take on all the responsibilities of being a transit provider. We wouldn't be an RTD uh, or even a smaller transit service for just Longmont, but we would administer the program and let this private vendor do that. So um, we do control the level and the location of the services, so that would be good. Our existing microtransit models serve cities very similar to Longmont, so we've seen this proven out in other suburban models before. And so that's part of the reasoning why we looked into this was we started seeing these uh, suburban communities around the country really uh, grabbing onto this model, and it's, this is really what filled in those gaps between the fixed route and the different services that are out there. Uh, this is just a quick diagram of kind of our existing services. The orange pieces are all the RTD, Regional Transportation District, supported by sales tax. We also buy up uh, what's called buy up the service for the local route so that they're free to the user. Uh, a lot of people don't under know that or understand it, but that's kind of what's going on underneath. Uh, so that allows the fixed routes to operate for free for the local. Then the fixed routes also include the regional pieces. Uh, there's regional buses as well to that. Um, the accessor ride, which is a required service that RTD has to provide Wherever there's a fixed route, they have to provide accessible routes that um, allow for anybody with a disability to be able to access transit systems. So, but you have to qualify for that service. And then there's the flex ride, which is their version of call and ride. And right now they have about one, sometimes two vehicles, but it's really one vehicle for the whole city. And it just doesn't operate. It's one of these things where you have to kind of sub start a sub subscription service at least a day before, if not a number of days before, before you can get the ride for the next day. So it's a little clunky in that way, I'll be honest with you. We also have VIA, which we uh, pay them yearly, a very, uh, an annual payment uh, to them. They provide the paratransit services, which they really only cover people with disabilities and then people, older adults. So those are the two groups that VIA serves specifically. So um, they might be interested in the micromobility piece of this, but that's yet to be seen. And then Transport's our partners up in uh, Fort Collins. Uh, they are the transit provider. They provide the regional flex bus service that comes through town. It's um, actually a really great service if you've not tried it. It's, a, it's, a, it's one to kind of see if you want to get up to Loveland and Fort Collins. Uh, we have a lot of employees that use it as well. Uh, and it provides that fixed route between the two. What we really like for microtransit to do is consolidate a lot of what's happening with the fixed ride, or the fixed, yeah, the flex ride, excuse me, and uh, be a more robust system there. And so we're asking RTD and the partnership program, hey, we need to uh, basically partner with you, take over some of this flex ride service, and then what you're spending on that, we would like to get some of those dollars to help us build this more robust trans transit service. So again, partner with RTD on that program, uh, with the partnership program, we have applied, which is great. So we're out there, we've got our name in the, in the, in the hat, I guess, uh, hope, to, hope to be selected for, for some of this. We, we asked council how much money they wanted to go for, if we could go uh, for $600,000. Uh, 
if they wanted to do a portion of that or if they wanted to do all that. Council was very clear that they wanted us to ask for the maximum amount. Uh, that definitely helps uh, our budget process if we can get that. Uh, and that would be for the first year of the program. And after the first year, the first year really buys the buses and the rolling stock. So after that, the, the, pro the costs start to decrease a, a bit. So we need to get that squared away as well. Uh, some other interesting changes with RTD that we're, we're very excited about and may impact what we do in the future is in 2024, RTD is going to begin a new transit fare system. And so all the youth under 19 would be free, which is exciting. So that we're going to have to work with RTD anyway to, to talk about how we buy up the service and how much, you know, if they're going to offer free service for all of everybody under 19 and that's our primary user, maybe our costs could go down even more, which would be wonderful. And then you can see the reduction in fares. So all rides are $2.75. So even getting to Boulder, getting to Denver, would cost that same $2.75. There's not going to be a local and regional and express fares like before. Except for the law, except for the airport. Airport's still $10. So you got to mention that. Uh, that's a pretty expensive service for them to run. So they're going to keep that at $10. Low income people who qualify and people who are 65 years and older will pay a almost a half price discount fee of $1.35 or that $2.70 all day pass, which is wonderful. I mean, that's really, that's really inexpensive and that's very helpful for folks. And they, that accessor ride that's, that's required would go to four, would be four fifty for most people or $2.25 for low income. So there are a bunch of things that are on the horizon, which we're looking forward to. And again, council directed us as staff and again, we would have loved to have come before you in, uh, and it turned out we do have to do that in May. And we had RTD here in May, which was interesting too. So there's a bunch of weird coincidences, but um, council did direct staff to pursue that microtransit for Longmont. So we did go forward with that partnership program as they requested. And they also are directing staff on the future of the ride-free Longmont. We're, we made a commitment. I think there was a commitment by council that they really wanted to see the ride-free program continue and not disappear and not just go away when microtransit comes on board, but have a transition period so people can kind of learn microtransit and then we would see what the next steps are. So we're kind of um, on hold for that, for discontinuing that program, but we do have dollars that go to that program that would be great if uh, microtransit proves to be popular, uh, those dollars could eventually um, uh, transition into microtransit. So with that, we'll take, I'll take any questions and we, Jim is our budget guy for all this, so he uh, is, is helping put the dollars together to make this actually work, even. Um, so I have three questions for you, Phil. Um, so what would be the cost for a user to use the service? That's a great question we do not know yet. What we've been asked by some council members is that there be a cost because what happens in others what happens in other cities that we've seen this in is people will request a ride and then they won't show up because they know it's free and so here's here's you know kind of this empty shuttle that's kind of running around chasing people who don't want rides after all so we're thinking one to two dollars might be that um, that cost and that would be up front that would be with the app it would just be like um, it would be upfront, I believe. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be at the end of the ride like a Uber or Lyft. It would be a, a upfront fee. Okay. And I think what we'd have to work out, depending on which vendor we get, we'd have to work out if there's a, if you get that money back if you don't ride, or would there be half charge or whatever? Yeah, like what if they're late, for example, and you're late for whatever you needed to be for. Um. My second question is, uh, would you be able to order it in advance or is it really um, the 30 minute window that you're looking at? Our idea is that you could order it in advance and set up that same subscription service if you need it at the same time every day or if you needed it in three or four days, you could order that and have that on the books as it were. Okay. And um, my last question is, um, would, would there be um, recurring or one-offs? Like, could you do, like, okay, I'm going to be needing a ride every day for the next week, or would it be, you'd have to do one and then do another one? And 
So the same idea of a subscription service almost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. We'll have to see which vendors come forward with what kind of ideas, but it's all based on the software right now and how the robust robust level of the software. So I think what you're talking about could be accommodated pretty easily in what they've what we've heard so far about the software. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill, in your microtransit vision, how does the contractor make a profit? Well, they make a profit by what we pay them. So okay, so the so whatever city money we come up to, yeah, whatever we come up from with from RTD, we've also uh, I didn't even mention this. I apologize, but uh, we've we've asked for congressionally des designed or directed spending, one million dollars from our. Congressional delegation that includes the goose and the two senators senator Bennett and Hickenlooper We're on their list their short list for a million dollars It's it's kind of the new name for earmarks So as much money as we can kind of cobble together and then I don't have to ask Jim for as much money from the budget Which he's would be very happy about <laughs> um, But those dollars that we put together to Basically buy the service would be their profit or part of their profit. They'd cover expenses but so far what we've seen is that the vendors come up with a price tag to, to provide the four to six units or buses shuttles whatever out there and they're gleaning a profit from that so the contractor wouldn't be free to set the fares or increase them as they saw fit right they would they would one, our feedback as a city of what the fare should be if we want to pay for all of it or if we want to use fares to recoup some of those costs, but it's not going to be very much, right? The fares aren't going to cover very much of that because what we, re we really want to build ridership on the system. So there's no way that we'll be able to cover the full cost. No transit system covers the full cost of that. So um, that, would be, that would be part of our discussion is how much should that fare be Okay. Does that Thanks. answer? Sorry. Yes. I have another question for you. Um, what if you have like an uh, RTD uh, pass? Would that be um, covering the fare? The RTD pass would be strictly RTD. So unless we work out an agreement with RTD to take those in, I don't see that they would cover that. But there would be some kind of, we would want to do some kind of for equity for the for the equity piece of this we probably want to make sure that there was a tap card of some type that people wouldn't have to carry around cash or have a credit card necessarily to be able to use the system so there would be some kind of fair exchange or something like that but it wouldn't be part of the eco pass because that is very much proprietary to rtd okay. even though i might i, I just throw out there that Boulder, Co Boulder County covers the cost of the Eco Pass on the transport bus system up to Fort Collins. So even though that's not part of RTD, if you have your Eco Pass, uh, they'll they'll allow it on that one because Boulder County pays for it. Uh, th thanks, Phil, for that presentation. Um, you know, I, I was looking forward to it last month, but um, the. My my question is if you know we happen to get the two million when do, when a when do we find out and then after we solidify even more funding and figure out how much this is gonna cost when when do we offer the first bus? Yeah. Well, we're hoping to know all of our costs and all of our revenue by October and November of of this year. So. I'd like to be optimistic, and again, I might get poked in the eye over here, but um, I want to be optimist, optimistic and say we could start in Q2 of next year, oh. maybe Q3, but that's if all things go very well. Cool. And then a uh, final question is because, you know, I was kind of asked this to RTD because, you know, I'm disappointed that, you know, their buses only go till 8 p.m., that's kind of the same idea here, but then it, you know, I see at the end schedule is dynamic and able to adapt. So is that 
on our end much are we faster to adapt than RTD that takes six months to a year? We would hope so. Right. I mean, <laughs> the idea is just if, if we have dollars available to make that work. So if we get high, if we get a, a lot of demand for later in the evening, yeah. what we'd probably start to look at is where could we get rid of some service during the midday and could we shift it or do we have the dollars available if we get some of this grant, these grant dollars, could we use some of that to offset putting some service later in the evening, especially when we first kick off the program? And just get a big, you know, if we can kick this off big, then we can see where the demand is and kind of move it and adapt it based on what we see from the ridership. Because they're getting instant information, instant data, and then we should glean from that. Cool. No, I, I, thought, I love this idea and city control. Yeah. Um, can you tell me more about the RTD partnership program? Yeah, it's, this is the first year of the program, so we're kind of the guinea pig, and a lot of folks are kind of staying away for it, from it for that reason. So um, it's based on basically different parts of the region. Mm -hmm. So we there's the northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and then Boulder County, parts of RTD that they're going to look at. And each sub-district, each sub-region is allowed to go up for up to 600 thousand dollars per year and so this is the first year they're doing it we know we're in competition with the city of boulder because rtd is going to make them um, they've got a gun barrel shuttle that's starting up and they need to be part of the partner partnership program as well so we're we know we're competing with them and so they may take half of our dollars that we'd like to see but um that all that aside is this is the first year it's been done and they're allocating it based on sub-regions of the whole RTD district mm -hmm. and so we're hoping to get a piece of those dollars and again if we can get some other dollars from other sources uh, we'll blend this in mm -hmm. and the idea that if what we're trying to do is eliminate some pieces that RTD is already providing mm -hmm. shouldn't those dollars then also come back so not just the 600 or portion of six hundred thousand dollars but whatever they're currently spending on flex ride shouldn't we get a portion of those dollars too to come back if we're going to supplement it and be the new provider of that service. And so we've got a bunch of things that we're working with as far as negotiations. Mm -hmm. So it's based off of RTDs on data of all the regions that they're um, having participate then. Right. My fear is that there'll be one region that doesn't ask for any dollars. Mm -hmm. And so now does the 600 that was allocated for that region, or if they ask for less, mm -hmm. does that money just sit there and not go anywhere or do we try to ask for those dollars as well you know so right. it's just they're trying it out so we'll again we are the guinea pig in this mm -hmm. and we'll see how many other guinea pigs we have with us but uh, we'll see how it goes and hopefully it'll be positive thank you would the agreement with rtd include using RTD bus stops as microtransit pickup places? It seems like there could be some real benefits to having that as part of the agreement. Yeah, no, absolutely. That would be perfect to use those existing stops because then you could just say, go to this stop on this corner and we'll meet you there kind of thing. Obviously, that doesn't work for the whole city. There's lots of gaps in that fixed route bus system, but I think that's a great place to start. And in other places, there's one other place in the district that's doing this, Lone Tree, Colorado. So they've been working really well with RTD to share bus stops and things like that. Good. Yeah. The RTD stops typically have a, a sign on a post. You might be able to put some kind of small symbol on their post to indicate that it's a microtransit stop and eliminate some confusion. We're also talking, just real quick, um, we are working, and Ben in the back, so I'm going to embarrass, try to embarrass everybody who came tonight. Um, ben was uh, instrumental in putting together a program where we're going to try to get with those posts that you talked about, um, and this, is, it, this actually exi it exists in Greeley today, is there's a company that will provide seats that actually 
kind of bind to the post or part of the post, and they can also go independent. But it's just a small little seating place, so people will, we're trying to get a seat at every bus stop is kind of the, the vision. And so we're, we're working on that currently. And the, uh, the engineering group is doing a full inventory of every bus stop with the help of some great interns that we have from Front Range Community College. Yep. And uh, so they're going to help us put those uh, and, and find where, the, where there are gaps in that portion of the system because we really want this to be comfortable as well for people are going to have to wait. So I want it to be comfortable, reliable, and efficient. You mentioned that there's other suburban cities that have adopted a microtransit uh, model. Are, are there some in particular that you saw particularly appealing? Well, Arlington, Texas was the first thing that caught my attention with this. And so uh, we have called them and talked to them quite a bit about how their system operates and how this works. It's, it's a little different than what our model is, so uh, we're not going to replicate what they're doing, but um, we're going to tailor it for what we need in Longmont. Also, uh, Wilson, North Carolina is uh, another place that uh, basically does not have a major college campus. And so those are the kind of cities that we're looking at. Ones that were over 100,000 that did not have a major college campus was really our focus to who was making this work. Uh, additionally, Salem, Massachusetts has a Salem skipper. So um, they've, they've, they're working with this as well. And those are there's there's many others I can't come up with the top off the top of my head, but I can send you any examples if you'd like to see those in, in greater detail. Good place to start. Thanks. Thank you, Phil, for working on this. I think it really fills a gap that we knew was there. Uh, it's come up more than one. You know, seems like every board meeting it comes up that we need to fill that gap, and I think this is going to be very helpful. I'm. Wondering um, what your vision is for this experiment. Are you thinking you go all out for a year and see see what sticks? Are you is do you think the city council is going to go for a five year term before we adapt? I mean, we're going to adapt as we go. Uh, what are you thinking? From all the examples that we've heard from, it's it's highly recommend that you go at least two years. So we're thinking a three year program to really pilot this out and test it out and uh, kind of see what, what happens from there. But, um, I think that's our, our, our original plan. Our original plan is to do the three-year test and see how that goes. And if, it, if the numbers bear out, again, we're going to try to adapt to the conditions that we see based on the data. And so we're hopeful that we can make something work. Uh, and it'll also be contingent on the dollars that we receive we don't get enough dollars, and this you know, we, it requires many more dollars. We're probably going to have to adapt it to mm -hmm. something that is smaller in size and covers less of the city. That's not optimal, obviously, but that might be our reality is we have to uh, shrink this down a little bit. Right now we're talking for the entire Longmont planning area, so there's some places in the county that would be covered, like Willis Heights up north is in the county, but it's not part of the city technically, but it would be covered. Um, we're talking about maybe even doing a partnership with Bertha. They're talking about wanting to do this, and so they would provide some of the resources, and maybe we could share resources between the two. Uh, there's a big demand out east as well. So there's a lot of cities that might look at this and see if, it's, if it works as well from the outside, and if it does, they may want to partner with us on that. So there's some examples of that as well. So. That sounds good. So the idea is to get enough funding to do two years at least. Is that what I'm hearing? Again, we'd like to do three. Okay. If possible. Yeah, okay. so we're, Great. we're budgeting out for three years. Great. Now, here's the big question. Are we all going to be able to ride at home from after the board meetings? We're going to make sure that there's a special shuttle <laughs> available from 8 to 8.30. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We'll, we'll see what we need, yeah. Um, how are you going to accommodate cyclists? That's a great question. I'm not. I, I think we'll have to look at uh, putting that in the scope of work. So when we go out to the proposal, figure out how we can accommodate bicyclists. But I'm assuming it'll be more of the front rack based on the size of the 
the vehicles, the vehicles that we're looking for, the six passenger vans. Uh, so it might be a front rack that comes down is, is kind of what I've seen in others with maybe two spaces for bicycles in front. But not, my not, not for much bigger, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, not at this time, but we, it's all, all needs to go into the scope. So we'll see what we can be accommodating. Oh, and um, would you add extra stops beyond the RTD one so that there's like, um, especially like for the east side of Walmart where there's no RTD buses basically, would you add some like specific stops for the microtransit? This is a tricky question, but it's, um, well, it's a tricky answer because we wouldn't dictate where the stops would go. The microtransit company would do that and they would probably just give an intersection so they'd say maybe like the southwest corner of Quail and give me a name, you know, of uh, and Martin. And so they would say which corner to meet that the bus would stop on. And so that's really more of the example. It's not so much the bus stops going to a bus stop. It's they're picking, they'll probably pick a, a corner. And after a while, they'll, they'll start to understand where the stops are in relation to that meet place. But it's really going to be more about meeting at a at a specific location and trying to get a number of people there. So it's you won't get your own ride like Uber and Lyft sometimes or usually does, but it would be a combined. They're really trying to look to combine the rides, so they would have somebody meet you there, and so you might be waiting with somebody else and getting on the bus with one or two others, hopefully, depending on the success and the demand. Yeah, I just wanted to put a comment of how um, our, the current uh, uh, microtransit that we have, like the FlexRide, um, they they pick. I've had I've used the service. It is a little clunky since there's only one to two uh, buses right now working. But uh, like they pick me up directly from my house. So like the idea of having a post could be outdated depending on what con who picks up the contract. Yeah, I think the idea is pick me up on the corner of close and soon so that I can get there in 30 minutes. And that was the, the gap we were trying to fill. We weren't necessarily trying to follow RTD. We were trying to fill the gaps between RTD and, and need. Am I correct, Bill? Yeah, we're pretty sure we'll, we'll still need a fixed route bus service in town. And so um, we'll see where that works and where it doesn't. And if this fills in some of those gaps too, because you know, some of the buses, we wait 60 minutes for a bus. I am some aware. We made 30, yeah. Some are 30 minutes between buses. Um, so uh, there's obviously a huge demand all through the city. And uh, I think we've heard a lot of this at recent uh, public hearings where people have said, transit doesn't work for what, you know, for my part of, part of town. So we're trying to make transit work for the entire town and where a lot of the low, um, where the affordable housing, I should say, and attainable housing is going is in newer portions of the city that are mm -hmm. well without, well outside of where bus service can accommodate them. So this would help with a lot of that growth, we're hopeful of. Yeah, yeah great, thanks. So Phil, um, just a couple questions. With, in regards to Lone Tree, um, how long have they been running this program? They've been running it for at least a full year. If uh, I think it's been a little longer, maybe a year and a half. Okay, great. And and how has that been received public-wise in, in Lone Tree? In other words, do they look at it right now and say it's been a success, we're still in progress figuring it out, folks are using it? Do you, did you get any of those kind of metrics or information from them? Yeah, Lone Tree actually held a workshop on this um, a couple of weeks ago, and I attended down at Lone Tree, which was fun. Um, without transit, <laughs> so, um, but it, it was a very interesting example. They had nothing but glowing things to say about how the services worked for the city of Lone Tree right now, um, but we didn't get to talk to any passengers, but uh, there was a trial and it was, I wasn't part of that. I missed the, the trial piece of this because of the time that it took to get down there, but, uh, People were very impressed with the idea of just going to lunch and being able to just call up that service and it met all the requirements of, of time that the people who used it 
were trying to do, and they didn't they didn't talk to anybody before they used it. They just went and and said, "Hey, let's just go out there and try it out and see how it works," and did a lunch thing before the, the workshop started. And we're, we're very happy with the way it operated, with the number of vehicles that they had and the time that they waited. So um, that was something that they've been talking about for the last for all the data that they had. They've uh, shown pretty good success as far as being able to show that to other people. So we were impressed with what we saw, but again, it's not until it actually starts operating. We've also called a number of the, we've called Wilson, we've called Arlington, um, been to Salem and saw how that works, uh, just because I have a kid that goes to college out there. And so um, it's uh, been pretty impressive that we've seen so far, but there's all different companies that want to provide this, so we need to uh, go through the procurement process. Great, thank you. So I'm just looking at your timeline here and I'm thinking that's come, gonna come up pretty quickly. How are we gonna get this out to the public? Uh, whichever company that we select, we will put into the scope that they have to do a ro very robust marketing campaign and they'll want to do that in order to continue, keep the service going because if they if they fail, right, they don't get paid. And so there's a lot of incentive to do to do this right and do it well. So um, that's what we see. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I think that's one of the big advantages to using a private organization. Phil, uh, we're done with the micro trend microtransit update. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more action items. Do we have any action items that you can think of? We do not, not at this time. Okay, um, then I think what we can do is move to 11, which would be comments from board members. And uh, since we started on that side, we'll start on this side. So we'll start with uh, board member Bennett. Well, it, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm excited to see uh, where everything goes. I mean, I, um, yeah, I don't have any further comments. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm just excited we have more than four people now. So, you know, <laughs> yes. it, it's nice to hear some more voices. So uh, lo looking forward to the next year. So. And, and very excited for all these projects. Thank you. Staff, nicely done. Uh, we've really gotten on these two projects, um, and I realize how very busy your, uh, your schedules are this time of year especially. And um, thank you, Jane, for finding a, a replacement for Stacy so quickly. And I, I'm just wondering, um, I imagine there were orientation materials sent out to the new board members. And I'm just wondering if we could all have copies of that just so that we're all on the same page as we've um, progressed over the last year. We realized um, maybe there were some that didn't have the new rewrites of the bylaws that we had worked on. You know, and just if you've seen it already, then you don't need to reread it just to know that um, we all have the same documentation. And, how does anyone else, how does everyone else feel about that of the original four? Would that be helpful? Um, just for consistency, is that you think we do have it in that booklet? Is that what you're saying? I okay. provided that same copy that's at your for the four people oh, who are right existing. Here? I we we did a, a a little packet for everybody. This was okay. kind of a rollout for all the rules and procedures as well as our. Um, transportation plan to date, so what's existing, what we're currently going by. So we did hear you last time when you said that and provided that at your desks. Okay. Well, nicely done, again. I mean, um, and then, uh, so the other thing I'm thinking about is the um, amended crash report, which Caroline had worked on. Um, and I just want to give value to that and maybe give some time to review it. And as new board members, we didn't want to scare you at your first board meeting, but um, it's a good place to start. How does how do you all feel about that? 
Oh, um, they do an, we do an annual crash report, uh, which tells us where a lot of the transportation issues are within the, within the city. And we, and our last crash report asked for some amendments to it and some additional information be included. And I know that it was sent to us, um, but we never got a, a chance to discuss it as a board. I think maybe this might be a good base point, a good starting point for everyone to look at. Why don't we go ahead and add that to the agenda for next next meeting? Appreciate it. Thank you. And like I said, nicely done, staff. Uh, so appreciate you. And Kyle, I saw uh, I was at a crossing. It was not in Longmont, but there was a box there, and it looked like it had a camera in it. Is that what you're talking about, Up upgrading our, our uh, crossing signals to include a camera or something that detects maybe human? <laughs> uh, so the mid-blocks, we don't currently have plans to put in uh, detect it, uh, dedicated uh, detection there, but with our new traffic signal system we're trying to do this summer, um, there'll be like little ball cameras. There's a few older models throughout the city. Uh, you'll see the, about the new ones that are um, way more advanced, um, and those will be able to detect pedestrians and bicyclists. Oh, excellent, excellent. Thank you. So glad to have you on board. Thank you, staff, for the information updates. And once again, welcome to our new board members. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to return to Vision Zero. Um, so, Jim, do you have in mind a timeline for task force formation? And do we have a new deadline for selecting a member of the board to serve on the task force? We're hoping to get the, the, the task force up and running within the next three to four months. So what I'd be looking at, the first step would be uh, to be most effective is we, we need basically a staff member uh, that we have to hire. We're working on getting a, a position created for that. Uh, it's been a bit of a challenge to find somebody or, or find a job description that we can all agree on. Uh, so we're still working on that. So I would anticipate certainly within the next, I wanna, you know, inside three months, outside four months is what I would hope to, to, ha to have that, uh, put a call out for that in that time frame to start establishing uh, that committee or task force. And the follow-up question, when do we need to pick someone from our board to- Anytime now. <laughs> Anytime, okay. I, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, be one, one member, okay, it can be, you can have two members from the from the board. I'm not gonna kind of gonna limit what we want to have on there. We've got a couple of other other groups. The Bicycle Issues Committee. I think we we LDDA is asked to to be, have a seat at the table. Um, so um, I'm not. I don't. You know, the more more people we have, the more opinions we have for things. I think that would be beneficial. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Well, I'm excited to be here, and thanks for the updates. Um, I have a question about when we can request speakers to, especially as a new board member, I don't necessarily have all the background that everyone else does, and it'll be helpful to maybe have some speakers come in, um, especially like for the Vision Zero, um, maybe hearing from one of the other cities who have already gone down that path and have experience and maybe can help guide us in moving that way forward. Um, I also would like to hear from RTD as well about what their plans are with um, connecting us to other cities as well. Well, um, maybe to put some more color on that, we really don't have speakers come in or invite them. Uh, RTD gives a yearly uh, update. Um, and then based on whatever the transportation department uh, needs to discuss, they'll either bring somebody in to speak on that behalf, whether it's an engineer uh, or again, RTD, and Phil, you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct. We usually have our speakers to this group are typically people who are trying to get information out to you or try to get feedback from you. Uh, either they're all typically governments, so it's usually 
Boulder County, RTD, CDOT, uh, those kind of groups come in and, and do those things. We do have that um, Sustainability Transportation Summit that's coming up in August. I sent that out. I'm still looking to see what the payment could be, if it could be reduced. So we're working on that. But I would encourage you to come to that. That's going to have some national speakers, some statewide speakers. It's going to be a really interesting look at And it's going to be geared around rail. So, um, so it's going to be primarily focused on the rail piece. That means we're going to get some rail here. <laughs> it means we're going to try to get some rail. Yeah, we're going to keep trying. Keep on trying. We think we have money in the budget, too, to cover if anybody wants to go to that. And again, we're going to work with, uh, we're going to work with the, uh, um, the folks that are putting this on. And we are a member, so we're hoping that they do that. But they also need money to run and operate. So <laughs> it's kind of that balancing act of, Yes, for nonprofits, but those things. So anyway. Um, I just want to say this was really informative, and I learned a lot. And who do I need to talk to to get a crosswalk between <laughs> County Line and Cren uh, Chris right, Ken Pratt? Yeah, you. I need a crosswalk because at the end of that walkway, right like before the new development, it's a straight shot to Walmart, but it's like a like Frogger, you're gonna die if you keep walking over there. So I'll talk to you later then. <laughs> yeah, uh, feel free to shoot me an email, happy to answer. Um, and then as we do our de new development processes, we do look for uh, public improvements like you know crosswalks, but uh, generally to meet some uh, warrants or uh, certain criteria to install crosswalks and how we prioritize those throughout the rest of the city as well. So just a quick background, so just so you know. <laughs> And um, I'll go and then I'll, I'll let you, if that's okay. No, of course. I just wanted to uh, thank, or, uh, say welcome to the new members and thanks, Steph, for um, the accolades and the money, of course. Um, that's all good news and, and good stuff. And I do like the micro uh, transit update and, and what that direction is going, how you're basing it on some models that you've already seen. I think that's all very smart. Uh, looks like it's to be very metrics driven. So. That's that's what I've got. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, welcome, welcome, welcome to the new uh, board members. It is a pleasure, like Taylor said, to see more than four, well, five, including myself, here, um, and to hear your questions and perspectives and everything. So that's pretty cool. Um, really, the only thing I have to say is. Um, for the new board members, when, uh, Phil, when was RTD here for that presentation when we were going over about the free? They uh, came in May of this year. We usually have them in March, so we'll try to get them in March of next year. So what I would say is, was that recorded? So they can, we can, if you don't, or I can go back, yeah, I was going to say and see if we can get you all the clip of that recording so you can get more information about RTD and how they came up with this information, and this is all new for all of us. Um, and also, do we have anything that's recorded about Vision Zero? I know with City Council, we did have, you all had a session and provided some information um, that may have been on C during City Council. I'm not sure if we had one here. I think we had two different City Council meetings where we presented. Maybe the, the one, most recent the most one. Most recent one was. Yeah, yeah. Find it and we'll we'll get that to you. Yeah, I just want them to be able to have that opportunity to review about Vision Zero, what we all came up with, and then also RTD. So if you can review that, then you can write down your questions about what you don't understand, and especially now that we have a vision, this draft of Vision Zero uh, action plan about the task force. So you may have even more questions. Um, so. Just remember, if there are anything that we are talking about that from the past, we should have some something either with uh, during the city council meeting um, where staff had brought it to city council, or we may have already had a presentation about, um, say, for instance, something about the um, the mobility plan or something like that. 
So just just know that, and you can always ask us and um, ask me so I can ask someone else. <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be a great opportunity for you all um, if we can find those clips for you and then you can learn more. That's it. Thank you all for such a wonderful job as always. And the interns are doing good, I hear. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the items for the upcoming agenda, uh, next scheduled meeting is gonna be August 14th. We're gonna do the CIP um, projects and, and of course the update to that. And anything else that we've added today, I know we've mentioned the crash report, uh, the amended ca uh, cash rep crash report. Um, okay, um, I don't think we have any other comments, so can we get a motion to adjourn? <laughs>